everybody. This is Will Murphy coming to you from Mac Lighting in Los Angeles. How are you today? I'm joined today by my colleague Kat Covell. Hey, Will Murphy. Uh, welcome to today's Tech Talks webinar where we're going to do a very short discussion of just copying and moving cues since that is a regular question that we get all the time in support land. And as you probably noticed, we were asking for more questions this time uh, because we're basically going to go through a lot of questions now. So um, some of my webinars have topics have gone on for a long time. Uh, we picked a very small webinar topic this time, so it'll be very short and uh, it'll just be some basic stuff about uh, copying and moving cues. And then we'll jump to your questions. Uh, Okay, Grand May 2 software, yay. Okay, um, so I have an executor selected right here, and I have these cool buttons, uh, delete, copy, move. Uh, I think deleting a queue is pretty straightforward. If I say delete Q6, put my face over there. Uh, delete Q6, uh, you're gonna get an option for normal or queue only delete in this case, uh, if I were to choose normal, um, nothing changes about the tracking. See the purple, the magenta stuff is the track data. If I try that again, uh, it, I get a queue only option. Nothing happens because there's no data to a uh, hard store. Um, let's say, for instance, I really like Q15 and I want this to be Q. 6.5. So I'm going to copy Q15 at Q6.5, and I get this pop-up. If I copy that, you notice it just takes the actual values that were here and inserts them in between here. Since dimmer was a track value, it didn't touch dimmer. Um, since the color was different, you notice that it changed the color here to blue, and now the blue has tracked forward, which has changed how Q10, uh, uh, 13 looks. Q13 used to be magenta at full. Now it's blue at full. That might not be what you wanted. So remember, there's a handy way to repeat syntax by hitting the up arrow on your internal keyboard. Copy Q15 at Q6.5, please. I have an option to choose Q only. Uh, when I choose Q only, it inserts the data here, but it maintains the data in the following queue as it was previously. So now Q13 is still uh, full in magenta. So Q only says put the copied queue in, Q6.5, keep the following queue as it was originally stored. So it hard stores the magenta values so that it stays that way. Um, the other the other option you get, let's say uh, Q15, I'm going to change this to 75%. Um, nope, that's not what I meant to do. Uh, change this one to 75%. 775, that's good. So we change that to 75%. Now, if I copy Q15 again, do this, uh, we'll just say copy. Uh, notice it didn't copy it at 100. So I have not preserved the original look. I have not preserved the status. I've only copied the hard stored values. If I want to preserve the original look, that's where you will use that status key. I want to copy everything, the status, everything that it takes to recreate that Q16 and put it in the slot of Q6.5. And now you see how it copies it at full. So it copies the tracked data as well. That's the idea, status of the queue, what it looks like. Now remember, if you don't want it to keep tracking at full, then combine both these checkboxes, status and queue only. So in Q6.5, it'll look exactly like Q6.15, 16, uh, 16. Um, and then seven returns to what it was before. So there's two options there. 
Remember, if you need help with copy, help copy. Um, then you can navigate towards the copy key and the copy keyword, etc. Um, the other one we mentioned was uh, were we going to talk about move? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So if you want to move a queue, I could just say uh, move to four at four point five. Okay, I haven't actually changed its position in the list, so I don't get any pop-ups. I'm just that that move command is basically just renumbering queues. So if you'd like to renumber queues via syntax, get that question all the time through the years. How do I renumber queues via syntax? I say use the move key, and they go <laughs> mind blown. <laughs> um, but if you're moving across queues, so if I try to move queue uh, 4.5 at we get 14.5. You'll notice you're not going to get status pop-ups or anything, but it really is going to affect your tracking. So if you really have to move a lot of cues around and you want to preserve all the looks, one of the things you could do, you could right-click in your tracking sheet, block complete. Now you have all hard data. I would repeat that move command. So now I've moved Q14.5, I've preserved the look of all the previous queues, and then I can go back and unblock complete and bring back all my tracking. So that's another little trick to deploy. You can actually do that via syntax as well. I could uh, block sequence one and unblock sequence one. Or you could do this through via queues, block Q through, um, unblock Q through. That's the gist of copy, right? Yeah, you want to copy to a different, a new Sounds sequence? Like, yeah. I'll copy into a different sequence. Yeah, this is this is within the sequence. What if yeah. I I want to put it on a different executor, put it into a different sequence? So just so you can see, I have two executors here, executor one and two, or sequence one and two. They happen to be lined up. You know, if, keep in mind this is sequence 100 over here, even though it's on executor 30. Um, so I just created a view here where this tracking sheet is looking at the selected executor one. This tracking sheet I have assigned specifically to look at the data of executor fader two. And let's say I really like Q14.5 and I want to put that in this Q list at six point at Q6.5. Well, I'm copying Q14.5 specifically in executor one to Q6.5 in Executor 2. So you're going to copy Q14.5, Executor 1, at Q6.5, Executor 2. You get the same pop-ups. I will refrain from clicking those at the moment, and you're going to notice no color data came over because the source queue is a tracked value. There's nothing to copy here. It's a tracked value. This is a hard value. So the color data didn't come over. So you can oops that. And what I should have done is I want to copy the status. I want to copy whatever Q14.5 looks like and recreate that in the second executor queue list. So now I actually get the color values this time because I copied the status. Okay. That's between two executors. Okay. Now, um, we have a good chunk of questions about copy. So you you ready to get your copy on here? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. All right. So uh, that was actually a really great example of going over um, your tracking options there. I see a couple of questions about how to avoid uh, tracking issues. And status is, of course, um, a way to do so. Um, now, another one I keep seeing over and over here, Will, how do I copy attributes um, from a fixture that are stored into a queue to a fixture in the programmer? So basically, how do I grab what my fixture is doing in that in that queue and put that in my programmer for future storing? Perfect. Yep. Very common question. Logically, it makes perfect sense. Everyone wants to assume that you use the copy key, but you don't. For a very specific uh, reason, well, I don't know what I'm looking for here. I'm looking for the command line. Uh, here we go. So I just want to point out. We'll make a. I'm just going to make a preset here so you guys can look at some 
syntax, how some syntax works. So we'll just make a magenta, a magenta preset here. So if I select this fixture and I put it at a preset, the syntax is at preset 4.11 because this is pool for preset 11. If I tell the fixture to be at 50, I'm telling it to be at 50%. So the two examples here is I'm, I have a selected fixture. I'm telling it to be at a level or at an object. A preset is an object. A queue is an object. A sequence is an object. You're telling fixtures to be at objects. You're not copying data to the programmer. You're telling your selection that's in the programmer to be at the values of an object. So I have executor 1 selected. I want fixture 101 to actually look like Q15. I don't want it to be at a preset. I don't want it to be at a level. I want it to be at Q15. And you see how it pulls the data from Q, the object Q15, the data in that object, and puts it at a level. Now, this queue might have tons of fixtures in it. It's only referencing the current selection the same way that when you grab a preset it only applies itself to your current selected fixtures. If you don't know what fixtures are in a queue in a queue list but in the queue but you want that queue in your program or you can use the call keyword. So I would say on uh, sorry I would say call Q15. Notice that pull it doesn't select the fixture, it just pulls the data from the queue into your programmer and you could say if output to actually select that fixture. You think that answered that? Yeah, but I want to take it one step further here. Uh, Will, what if you just wanted to grab one attribute? Um, what if I only wanted to grab that color information? I didn't want to grab the dimmer information. Yeah, so that's where you're going to use the if keyword because the if keyword stands for only if. So if I only if I want the data from Q15, I, I have my fixture one of one selected. See that here? I want it to be at Q. 15, but only if, which is the if keyword, color. I clicked on this color button here. It doesn't pull the dimmer information. Uh, the other method you could do, if you can't remember that, uh, you can uh, select your fixture, hold your at key, you can let go of your at key. You could say, I just want this data. You can specify the attributes that you want. Uh, if I only wanted mixed color. And then I finish the syntax Q15, please. We close that, we see it only pulls in. So that's the at filter. Now keep in mind this at key is flashing because your at filter will stay activated until you clear your programmer or until you hold that at key and reselect all those values. So if you've ever wondered why the at key is flashing, it's because you've enabled the attribute filter which on, only allows the programmer to have access to the attributes that are highlighted in this window. Um, you also may have noticed that that's directly correlated with the filter pool. So if you guys are constantly pulling data of specific attributes, I would certainly recommend setting up filters. Um, just to repeat that example with filters, I've just created a color only filter and I would do this, I would do this and at Q15. So I called the filter before I'm running the at Q syntax and oops, I mean hit so at Q and then please, it's following my selected, uh, it's following my called filter. That works for presets as well. If you have an all preset with a ton of data in it, you can say color only and then tap on the all preset and it only pulls the color data out. Is that good? Cool. Yeah, that was a good explanation of using those filters. Um, Here's an actual decent question here. Uh, so what if I, I, I have a look um, uh, in one of my queues and I've actually stored just hard values like you have there. Now how do I um, then just go about saving it to a preset? What, how do I get that out so that I can save those hard values to a preset? Mm. 
No problem. I, just, I forgot to save a view here, so I'm bringing my view back here. So you want to call some data out and put it into a preset? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I guess um, we want a color pool here. And maybe I want that to be preset 13. So we got to grab the fixture first. Uh, remember we want at Q5. Um, that calls the data in. And maybe I'm going to store this as a global color. So we choose global. And now I have a global color preset. Uh, I call that again. And I can say store Q5, please merge. And now it's referencing the preset that I just made. So I might do that again by saying that Q15, uh, store global. That's going to be the next preset. Call, call the preset so it's active in your programmer. And then uh, let's just select the fixture first. I accidentally edited the preset. Sorry about that. So try that again. Fixture 101, call the preset, store that to Q, looks like 15. And then we'll merge, and now it's referencing a preset. I don't know, uh, just one other example. Oops, that. Let's see if this works. You can actually edit this, and the blue preset shows up. I don't know if you guys caught that. In the actual tracking sheet, you can right click, make sure it's set to encoder group, edit see preset 4.14, which is blue, and now I've just fixed my hard stored values via my tracking sheet by right clicking. Awesome. Those particular tools, by the way, this right clicking stuff is really good for, you know, the hotel room and the airplane when you have to go through and fix all your data uh, before your next show. Knowing these little mouse tools is very helpful. Uh, I see a lot of questions kind of popping up about controlling and copying multiple things. So how would I uh, copy a queue, store it to multiple executors, and along those same lines, um, what happens with status when you're going to multiple executors? Um, what happens with status? Yeah. Status? A million times I get people that don't understand this. Status only applies to the source data. Do you want the magenta values, do you want the magenta tracked values or not? Status says, do I only copy the source hard stored data or do I copy the look of that queue? Status has nothing, absolutely nothing to do with destination. So if you copy Q7, these are tracked values, and you don't choose status, you're not going to get anything at your destination. If you choose status, though, it's going to copy 75% and uh, this color, and then put it wherever you want. Um, you can't copy queues to empty executors, though, so you're going to have to make your empty executors first, which do something like this, All right? So we have those four executors. We have those four executors: six, seven, eight, and nine. So I do something like copy Q. 7, executor 1, at Q1, executor 7 through 9. And it doesn't work. <laughs> um, what did I type? 7 through 9? This probably doesn't work for a range of executors. I feel like I suddenly remember something now. I'm just going to try not the through key. No. Um, I think I can try, actually, in this case, you have to do sequences. So sequence 1 to sequence 3 through 6. Why don't we try that? Uh, yeah, I do have a... Okay. Copy Q7, sequence 1, at Q1, sequence 3, 4, 5, and 6. Huh. 
Maybe this is why they're asking me this question. Do you remember, Kat? Mm, I really I was actually sitting here and playing with it. I'd do the exact same thing as you. <laughs> is I always better? laugh about these because yeah. people, when they email support, uh, support, they think we know all these answers off the top of my head. It's like, no, we just know how to try it out until we find the uh, answer. This is actually a really good uh, exercise in how we find the answer, yeah. which is you do it over and over again <laughs> until you realize what's happening. I just going to double check that. Yeah, I can go to one executor. And. I can go to one sequence, but you would like a range of sequences, and it's going to fail. Just wondering if uh, I could try sequence three through six. Um, merge. Select executor six. Nope. Now the question is, did I put it in a bulletin? I feel like I've done this before. Now I'm going to get frustrated because I don't remember the order of the syntax. Copy, Q. So really the answer to the question is just uh, get the syntax right. Well, yeah, of course. <laughs> I can try reversing the syntax. Normally I speak copy sequence 1. Q7 at sequence 3 through 6. Q1. Nope. I uh, kind of feel like uh, for some reason I can't do a range of sequences, and I'm not sure why. I really thought that was possible. Well, we, might, we might have to explore after yep. the webinar and um, let you guys know what we find. Yep. We can move on to more questions that we can answer. All right, questions that we can actually answer. Let's look for some of those. Uh, hey, Will. Um, can you give me an example of why and how copy differs from clone? Yeah, because they're two different things. They're not the same at all. Um, this, there is a terminology challenge with these two because I do know the different manufacturers, what we refer to as copy, other manufacturers refer to as clone and vice versa. So there's a lot of confusion in the biz. Copy is about copying uh, objects. So a queue is an object. A sequence is an object. A preset is an object. You're copying the object. Clone is related to the actual fixture data. Um, if I go back to select executor one, this is fixture data. Okay, in your mind, when you copy a queue, you think you're copying fixture data, but you're not. You're copying the actual queue data the queue object with its data. Clone is only looking at these stored values and it's taking it to other fixtures. I'm taking data from one fixture to another fixture. So if I copy Q7, it's copying the content and the fixture associated with that. If I'm cloning, I'm saying I want the fixture data of 101 to also exist on a different fixture. So a, a very simple example within a single queue list, look, look at what happens when I say clone the source fixture data, 101's data, at fixture 102 uh, only in executor 1. I haven't copied any queues. I haven't copied any objects. I've taken the data that already existed for fixture 101 and mirrored it or cloned it to fixture 102. So from a, from a philosophical and technical standpoint, copy is for existing objects. Individual fixture data is where you use clone. And remember, when I pull data into the programmer, I was not using the copy keyword because, once again, copy is for existing object data. The programmer, you put fixture values at the data that exists in the object, and clone is your mirroring 
existing fixture data inside of an object to another fixture that's in that object. And I think we have a clone webinar. We do have right? a clone webinar. Yeah. So if if you navigate to support.acklighting.com, you find our YouTube channel. You can find our Tech Talks playlist and there's a clone. Yeah, there's a clone webinar in here that covers everything related to cloning. Um, remember, you can also find help with help copy, right? And then there's also help clone, which tells you how to use the clone syntax in case you don't remember. Cool. Yeah. All right. I have another question that seems to be popping up um, a little bit here. Uh, why is it that sometimes when I copy a Q stack to another one and I edit the new stack, it also affects the one that it's copied from? You copying? What are you copying? Executors? A Q. When I copy a Q to another Q stack, so just like we did where we copied one um, Q to another one, why when I'm editing that new queue and that new one, is it affecting my original queue? We talked about this earlier. It's uh, probably because of your presets. Yeah. When you copy a queue, there is no relationship to the two objects. So the only relationship that might exist is that you've actually copied the preset as well. And the queue is referencing the preset. So if I copy... Uh, we'll copy Q15, Executor1, at Q15, Executor2. I'm going to copy the status over there. These are two different sequences, two different executors, but these Qs, yeah, they're both Q15. That just happens to be the numbers that I've chosen, but they're both referencing the same preset. So if I change this, to magenta, Q15 over here is still the same. So there's no relationship there. Um, so I'm only taking a guess at what you're experiencing is that maybe you're actually uh, editing the preset itself. So if I grab fixture 101, and I make it, you know, 50% blue and 100% green. You know, it's a very different color now. I might update. If I update that original preset, now both of these are a new color because it's the, it's the preset that they're referencing that is shared. But the queue, there is absolutely no relationship. And the only other conundrum that I can point out is that people will copy executors copy this executor here, copy this executor here, look it. Yeah, they're different executors, but they're all the same sequence. They're all sequence one. So if you change something here, yeah, it's going to affect this one because it's the same sequence, and a sequence is a list of queues. If you actually want to make a new executor of the same queue list, but you want the ability to change this queue list, then you first have to go to your sequence pool and copy the sequence. Okay, so the first thing I would actually do in this case is I want to copy sequence one here, and then I'm going to assign, this is now sequence 17, so I'm going to uh, delete these. I don't want them to be the same. I want to assign sequence 17 at this executor. So now, currently, they're going to look exactly the same, but I can edit these cues, and it won't have any effect on sequence one. That's usually the confusion that people have. Now, why do we do it that way? If you think a rock and roll show, you build a red-green or a red-blue sequence, you might use that in 20 different songs. So you're going to use that same sequence on multiple executors across multiple pages. So yeah, it makes sense that we have this. Otherwise, you're going to have 50 sequences that are all the same, and that's a big waste of data. But in this example, if you intend to reuse a queue list that you really like but want the ability to change it without affecting the first one, make sure you copy the sequence first and then assign that copied sequence to a new executor. So I hope that clarified the original question. 
You did. Yeah, I think it did. You actually elaborated really well. Yeah. I didn't think of uh, copying sequence. I'm just guess- to the same place. That was a that was yeah. a good look there. We're just get. I'm yeah. just guessing what your question really means. So somehow you have a connection, but there's no way for two cues in two different two different sequences to have any connection, other than the preset that they're referencing. Great. Um, it looks like that was it for copy questions. I'm starting. I, we want to move on to just uh, randoms. Yes. Yeah. See what we could. Uh, what kind of info we can get out of you. Hey, Will Murphy, how do I take my autosave macro and put it on an executor so I have a nice quick place for my autosave? Uh, click the empty title bar, function, macro, find your macro in your pool that you want here, which, <laughs> lucky me, quick save. <laughs> <laughs> how I managed to find that in the list, I don't know. It's alphabetical? That that helps, right? I wasn't even <laughs> no, looking no, for it. No. It was like scrolling randomly. Uh, Lucky you. All right. Uh, hey, Will Riffy, how do I control the size of an effect on an executor? With a temp fader. Um, so what do we have? We have some effects here. Yeah. So why don't I do through one one through one twelve? We do move circle. Uh, store that here, and select that, and now stage view, we should be able to see that. Probably should have turned those on. Probably should have turned those on. Oh, I'm selecting the wrong thing here. Select fixture in that executor, bring those to full, we're going to Store that back here, merge. Um, I'm going to turn off everything. Now I'm going to hit go. Okay. And uh, this executor is currently a master fader. So you want to change that to a temp fader. And then the temp fader actually controls the size. So I'm working on the wrong cue list here, guys. Sorry about that. Temp fader. There we go. So bring it up down. So now if we jump back to screen two, you'll see it's at half the size. Uh, now it's at much bigger. Now it's really tiny. Okay. Cool. Uh, hey, Will Murphy, can you explain that little heart in the bottom right of your screen? Yeah, blue heart says that I am the master of the session. Uh, if I leave session, I have a broken heart. And if I'm a connected station, if I'm not the master, if I'm actually a connected station, it will be green. So it tells you you're good. And by the way, you guys can always click on this. These symbols, they tell you right here what they are. The blue means the session is, the console is master. Um, there's a whole webinar on MANet configuration as well, which covers everything about sessions related to that blue and green heart. Um, if I have a fixture, let's say it's an RGBW fixture, um, and I want to put a color effect on it, and I want to go between my two presets, um, how can I make it so that I don't get uh, those undesired colors uh, in the middle going from preset A to preset B? Oh, yeah. I was just talking to my, I was talking to my colleague the other day about that. Um, so a lot of people gravitate towards the sine wave uh, form, and they'll say, you know, magenta and then blue. Um, let's see what this looks like. So you see, you get this kind of this green. Nope, is that right? Uh, uh, I'll uh, executor through. Something feels funny to me. I'm not sure why this first order is <laughs> turning green and the rest of them aren't. I don't know that magenta is really a good color. What's the two like opposing colors? 
Um, I would say yellow and yeah, that that might that's probably gonna do something kind of funky in there. Yeah, you see, you get this kind of it's it's easier to see this in MA three D, which I don't have open right now, but you see this like gradient that's in between the two colors. A better way to combat this is don't don't use a sine wave because then your the, the the ramp of the sine wave is floating through all the other colors. Um, instead, start with PWM because then you're gonna get just the two colors, red, blue, red, blue. I have, I have a broken fixture. These bro fixtures don't just break in real life. They break in MA, in, in the console as well. <laughs> um, I don't know what that is. I don't know what's doing that. Um, You've obviously been playing with that fixture type, Will. Uh, apparently. Yeah. I thought I loaded a fresh show file, but I must have changed something about the fixture type. Um, anyway, back to editing effects. That's a little harsh because it's a square wave. Um, this is where PWM attack and decay become really helpful because you can do a little bit of a rise and a little bit of a, a little bit of a decay. So it adds a nice little fade to the end, the beginning and the end of the square wave, something that you, you, know, you can actually adjust. Just work with it in real life until you feel good. Um, I do know if you have a very specific path especially as you get more colors in your fixture, you're going to have to individually edit every single form here. And it is doable with a custom form, um, but it's going to take a lot of finesse. So if I have a five color LED, um, I suppose I could start with this one and add a point and I drag that up there and then I'll do that one and add a point and I drag that over there and you know, maybe I have to add two points to really get this color to be kind of like this. So, you know, I, I, we have the tools in here. It's just there's no kind of color path available. But I suppose it's workable if you have a very specific need. Otherwise, I think most majority of situations you get away with PWM and just put a little attack and decay on each end. So, Will, uh, it looks like our viewers are actually paying way more attention than we are because uh, you changed that, you updated that preset earlier. <laughs> so that was why. Uh -huh. I would explain. So, it. I'm uh, idiot. Thank, <laughs> you. Uh, thank you guys for pointing that out because um, obviously we're just trying to answer as many questions as possible here, not um, paying attention to what we did earlier. Uh, actually, while we're on the color, uh, uh, or on the topic of these uh, LEDs, uh, so say I have one of these new LEDs. It's got um, multi uh, colors. It's got seven different LEDs. Am I able to use uh, that particular fixture with the color picker? Does the color picker utilize all seven of those LEDs? Yeah. Uh, we have some five color LEDs, so you can see this what it's doing. Um, so color picker. You go into raw fader mode, you get individual control of each of these. With a the seven color fixture, you're going to see seven faders. But this HSB mode, notice as I move around, uh, you can't see the white, the white, but the white is moving also. Uh, if I go down here, you're going to see a lot more white. But if we just look at RGB amber, as I move around, you'll see when I get into the yellows, the amber kicks in. That's because of this quality fader. Maximum output. Use what this is saying right now. This is use all available LEDs to give me the maximum output of this color. So of course it's going to use amber in that case. If I go to primary, amber and white go to, to go to zero. If it was a seven color LED, everything would go to zero except for RGB because RGB is part of the primary. So this becomes handy when you have a mix of three color, five color, and seven color LEDs in your rig, and you really just want the same blue across the board. Um, if you're just going for maximum output, leave it to that. It's going to mix it with all available LEDs. And if you want the purest mix, which is where seven colors become helpful, uh, go to the purest mix. You'll notice over here when I get into this that nice amber color, I'm almost only using amber and white. I'm not using any RGB, where if I go back up to maximum, I bring a lot of RGB back into it. So fool around with this. This is not an attribute. This does not get stored anywhere. It's just an algorithm, okay? So when you store the preset, it's just storing these five colors, but this is what you can play with to get the perfect color 
output that you want. All right. Cool. Cool. Uh, hey, Will, how do I fan a fixture position? Watch the Align webinar? <laughs> do we have an Align webinar? We do have an Align webinar. I don't know where it is. There it is. I think you should just watch the Align webinar. It actually goes all in-depth about aligning fixtures and... Uh, yeah. Oh, oh, there's an old picture of me right there. Wow, wow, well, you have quite the epic beard going on over there. Um, Will, can you please explain the different Q modes, normal, assert, and ex-assert? Mm -hmm. I think uh, a lot of that is probably best covered in the tracking webinar, so I definitely suggest watching that one. And the page in the help manual explains it. Let's do a quick search. Break is probably the most useful one, by the way, but uh, working with tracking sequences in queue modes is a great uh, tool. Let's see. Working with queue modes, I'll just copy this link, but I can chat this to all you guys so you all can open it up and have a read. Um, and open it up quickly. <laughs> yeah, open that, click on that before we close the webinar because you'll lose it. Um, but it explains it here. Break is the most common one uh, because it prevents tracking in the queue list. So if I just jump back to this um, example that I had earlier, uh, select executor one for you know, maybe I want, remember how I copied Q15 up here? Maybe I want to make sure that everything from Q9 onwards never changes, no matter what I do up above. Um, that's where I would jump over to the mode column and set it to break. Because it puts a big white line, and it says nothing's allowed to track through that. It keeps the existing data in place, of course, but from this point on, if I copy Q15 at Q6, Copy, copy, copy Q15, I'll just do a status, uh, merge. You see that white line keeps Q9 intact, even though previous data has changed. So very handy um, to use that break function because if you add more fixtures up here, after you've finished your show, you want to make sure it doesn't affect data later on in the queue list. That's a basic understanding. You can check the help manual for more. Okay? I was actually just working you up to this awesome question, which is, what is the best way for beginners to actually learn about the console? And we have a ton of different ways that you can learn about the console. And Will just actually showed you a bunch of those ways. Um, obviously, this help manual is... Uh, chock full of amazing information or else we wouldn't have just talked about it like three, four, five times during the same webinar here. Um, Help people, to yep. uh, malighting.com, by the way. People tend to ask this question a lot, and I say read the help manual. When you're done reading it, read it again. When mm -hmm. you're done reading it, wait a, you know, a little while, then read it again. Like it's, it's the best way to kind of commit this stuff to memory. Um, on top of that, we have so many resources. We have this uh, our support hub here with our knowledge base. Um, and information on what we teach in the classes, which links you to more bulletins, um, some fundamentals that we find important before you start learning the desk, um, as well as all of these will point you to the webinars um, as well. So there's just so much information on our website, the help manual, the bulletins, the webinars, um, MA-Share, I don't know if you have MA-Share up at all. There's also MA share. There's actually a cool thing I was going to show in the in our in our knowledge base. Uh, additional MA resources actually point to a lot of places such as MAShare.net. So this is what Kat's talking to MA-Share.net, the forum. It's very active. You can see already, you know, <laughs> five posts today. You know, it's a very active community. Um, it's a great place to learn. Read through it. 
years and years of information. There's 107 pages. You read through this, you're really going to understand the platform. And this takes you to the, the help manual. And, and you know, this is a, our webinars are on the Act Lighting YouTube channel. MA Lighting has a YouTube channel as well, so you learn some more. There's tons of information out there. You just have to sit down and do it. You know, Granite 2. Knowing how to use Granite 2 offers you a career. You don't build a career overnight. You have to study and research and try and study and research and try again and keep practicing, et cetera, et cetera. And that's all we have time for. That's everything? That's everything. It's actually almost all the questions. Yeah. Awesome. Well, hope you guys had fun. It's been a pleasure. Happy programming. Bye, Will Murphy. <laughs> Bye.